Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Paloma, and I am going to continue my tradition at North Bay Python by shoehorning in hardware talks that are only sort of tangentially related to Python. So thank you all for enabling me to uh, just near miss the point. Um, so I just have to get this quick disclaimer out of the way. This talk will contain hardware and more hardware than software, almost probably no software, but it's going to be useful um, because I think that it's really interesting to uh, analyze and embrace failure. So my first, um, my first talk at North Bay Python was my first time talking at a conference ever, and it was a talk called How to Build a Terrible Robot. Um, so check it out on the YouTube. Hey, like and subscribe uh, if you want to see that one. Um, but in that talk, I tried to help people understand that it's okay to embrace failure. Um, and in this talk, I'll expand on that. So this is the most useful and also most annoying bit of tech support advice. Just have you tried turning it off and on again? Uh, of course I haven't. Um, why would that fix the problem? I, if I don't fix the problem, it's going to do it again. Shut up, my computer hasn't been on for too long. I don't want it fixed. I want to know why it isn't working, right? This is an actual message of me to the IT person at my former company saying, my computer won't charge over USB-C anymore. Help. Also, I haven't tried turning it off and on again, lol. Um, and okay, so I don't just do this because I like being a pain in the butt to the IT departments. I just hate that that fixes so many things. Like I get that that returns everything to a known state, but if I don't understand how it got there, it's gonna get there again and again. And I wanna understand how to mitigate the failure in the future, not get around it and just accept that it's part of my day to day. And this is because I am a scientist not just a pain in the ass. I'm also a scientist here for truth, and I want to know why things are broken. And that leads me to become really interested in failure analysis, right? What is the failure? Why is it happening? And how can we mitigate it in the future? So just a quick aside, um, the last time I spoke at North Bay Python, I was working at Xerox Park and I was working on autonomous ocean drifters that monitor marine and maritime environments and report that data in real time via satellite to the cloud. I then decided I wanted to just totally change things up and do something different, so I started working at SOFAR, which makes autonomous ocean drifters that monitor marine and maritime environments and report that data in real time to the cloud via satellite. But then the great layoffs of 2022, so I decided to completely reinvent myself and do something totally new and different. And now I work at Sail Drone, which does unmanned ocean vehicles <laughs> to monitor marine and maritime environments and report that data via satellite to the cloud. Uh, so the first case study I'm gonna talk about is from my time at SOFAR, um, and it was for bending over a sheave. So for all of you, maritime nerds, you're going to know what that means, but essentially putting something over a pulley. So we made these maritime like ocean drifters and they had a smart mooring and the smart mooring would go down to the anchor to keep the drifter in one place. You could have it just free drifting in the ocean, but you could also have it moored so you can measure data at one specific point. But if you're going to have a cable tying something to the ground, you might as well put some sensors down there. So we made this smart mooring that we could then put sensors all down the water column to be able to understand temperature at different depths, maybe get a load cell in there to see how hard the line is being pulled, maybe add some different, like more interesting sensors for salinity, CO2, all sorts of stuff in there. But when you put a smart mooring attached to an anchor, people are gonna wanna pull it up by the smart mooring instead of sending a diver down to go disconnect it which makes sense. But what does every person tell you not to do with the cable plugged into the wall? Don't pull it by the cable, pull it out at the source, right? But these are my people and we don't listen to advice. So we just do what we want to because it's easier. Um, but this means that cables are gonna start breaking, right? And so we wanted to understand how many times somebody could do this incorrectly and what would the impacts be because we were seeing failures in the smart morning. 
So the first step was to understand the problem, right? This is a sort of what we call a con-op of the smart mooring system. We had the drifter, we had a surface float to kind of keep less tension on the line. Then there were some inline floats and various sensors along the way. So we had to think about what type of anchor should people use, because different anchor types require different levels of strength into the sand. We had to think about how often people were going to want to recover these and either you know, change out the SD cards in them or do all sorts of data analysis. They wanted to get the high frequency data. How often would that happen? What would it be like when they wanted to recover it? And what were the kinds of failure modes that we were seeing that were making this less than optimal? So the first step was to um, redesign the cable. Now this happened before I got there, so usually the first step was to investigate and then redesign. But we had some new designs and we wanted to validate them, see how much better they were. We had some ideas about how better they would be, but we wanted to take a deep look and see, okay, we thought this would be better, let's see how much better it is. So these are three of the cables in cross section. Uh, we started by increasing the diameter, the amount of Kevlar in there, the number of strands in the conductors, the size of the conductors, and changed the lay length of the cable or the way that they're twisted. And so all of these things we could theoretically say were going to be good, but without measuring it, we didn't really have any way to communicate how much better we had made things to customers. So we decided to rig up a test. So in this test here, you can kind of see we've got an anchor, we've got something connecting to a pulley or sheave, and then that goes to a winch, which then gets controlled, right? In testing, we wanna recreate the modality that we were seeing and quantify and compare results. So we also, like the outcome that we wanted from this was to determine recommendations for the sheave diameter, so how big of a sheave we had to recommend to customers, and also the safe working load. So what should you use to do this? How often do we think you can do it? Please never do it, but we know you won't listen to us, so if you have to, try this. So then we tested it. Recreate the modality, quantify comparative results, right? And then we used other machines to be able to understand and isolate different types of failure modes. So, okay, this talk has a lot of asides. Um, this one is that I believe personal branding is important, and I have decided to name all of these testing devices very important names. So that's the Bendy Bendy. This tests for uh, bending fatigue in cables. We put mustaches and googly eyes on things. This one is the Roly Pulley. This one lifts and lowers 450 pounds of weight over various size of sheaves and a capstan winch. Cutting into it was slicey dicey. See, we're getting there. Uh, this allowed us to take a look at what the failure modes were and also like quantify that the cables were being made to the manufacturer's specifications. And then yoinky doinky, we never got a better one for this, but uh, this was testing like the tensile strength and the amount that things stretched before the conductors broke. So when we were analyzing the failures, we did this stuff, we found out that they broke, we saw how much pressure, and we saw how many times it repeated, but we wanted to understand what kinds of failures they were. Why was it failing at that point? So we got out the fancy microscope and took a look at these conductors. And these are what we think are the three types of failure modes. We have the one on the left there is these like long conical shapes and that's from tensile pulling. Then the ones in the middle are from, um, oops, I'm wondering if I'm gonna step over the cat and it's just a rock in my shoe. Um, the one in the middle is from uh, bending. So if you bend something back and forth, you can kind of understand that it would be a flat break. And then the last one is what we kind of referred to as a combination of failure, where it kind of pulled and like twisted and then collapsed upon itself and crumpled up. And this failure would show as a break in the conductor, but as soon as it was no longer loaded, we got continuity again. So it was an interesting failure mode. We then took a look at the Kevlar, and here you can see the sort of four different stages of Kevlar. The first one in the upper left shows no damage. The second one shows just light damage. The third one shows more significant kind of 
pilling and you know ripping apart of that Kevlar, and this is where it failed on the capstan winch, and then the fourth one shows complete catastrophic Kevlar failure. We then plotted all of these results, and this is a beautiful and also kind of complicated thing. Um, so we ended up seeing that there were two failure modes, right? There was when the Kevlar failed, and then there was when the conductor failed. And if the conductor failed before the Kevlar failed, we were still getting continuity, or like we were stopping to get continuity, but we couldn't see anything fundamentally like break apart. But if the Kevlar failed before the conductor, it was a big, scary crash, right? So we started plotting these. And the first one is that we saw this uh, blue line is our V1 of the cable, right? It lifted and lowered that weight like 75 times on the first one and got more as we got to a higher diameter, right? This is number of anchor lifts versus the inches of the diameter, like of the, of the sheave. So then we tried V2 of this new design and said, oh no, this is real bad. It's worse than before. We're getting fewer numbers of lifts. But we weren't having the same failures because the Kevlar wasn't breaking. It was just the conductor. And so we kept going until the Kevlar broke. And it was actually over like almost 350 poles. But the V1 cable had the Kevlar break before the conductor. So we knew they were stronger, but something about the way that the conductors was failing was different. So we got the other manufacturer and put their stuff up and it blew both of them out of the water. This was over 200 lifts and lowers before we saw conductor failure and almost never saw Kevlar failure on that. So we created this wonderful plot that talks about all the different cycles to failure and the analyzation of like all of the different like conductor failure types, the Kevlar failures, and started to understand it and plot out how everything would happen in all these different scenarios and what the strengths and like weaknesses of these cables were. And then we were able to create a recommendation to the customer to say, okay, you can recover it this many times with these things. Again, please don't, but we know you're gonna do it. So this allowed us to not be afraid of failure, right? Like look into the failure, dive deep, analyze it, learn from it, and understand where your strengths and weaknesses are so you can work within that to provide like really awesome products that people can use. This is where we get into case study number two, uh, combat robotics. As you may have heard, uh, I am on Discovery's BattleBots. And if you watch Discovery BattleBots, you may understand that there is a lot of failure there. Um, as another aside, in writing this talk, I realized I'm very mean to robots. Um, I throw them in the ocean and then in a battle arena. And I don't know that that's fair. Um, but that's just the life that I've made for myself. So in combat robotics, you see failures all the time, and it is catastrophic failures of something that you love, have worked for months on, and you are just watching it get destroyed. So you kind of have to get okay with failure and with analyzing it and learning from it. Now, I could go into a lot of depth on all of the specific hardware failures that we saw, and I would be happy to chat with you throughout the conference about it if you have any questions. But I more want to focus on what I learned, because I know that that's applicable to any project that you're working on. So here's the problem space. I want to keep another robot from breaking my robot. And again, this is where I ran out of steam on slides, uh, because there's just too many failures to look into, and it's really cool. Um, so that is our robot, Hijinx, the very pretty one that's pink and blue and yellow. And that other robot is Sawblaze, the current world champion, destroying us. Um, we went the full three minutes, but we lost a lot of parts, and at one point had our drive motor just flopping around in front of the robot. So. We have had to learn a lot about how we make our robots stronger and how we adapt to failures. So here's some tips I wanted to bring to all of you for what you can do when you're trying to cope with, embrace, and understand failure. First thing is document everything meticulously. So when we get out of 
of battle. We start immediately going in and taking photos of everything. We start writing down everything we noticed, everything we saw, pictures in depth, trying to understand how things broke apart, ripped apart, which things caught on fire. And so that way we can understand what, what do we have to work with to understand this failure. This one, thanks to Cameron, uh, when I was talking about it, look where the evidence isn't. Um, survivorship bias, this is kind of a classic example, um, but when people were looking at planes that came back from war, they were seeing that there were a bunch of bullet holes concentrated in specific areas. And the first response may be, oh, I need to shore up those areas because that's where they're getting shot a bunch. But what they weren't thinking is, these are the planes that got back. The planes that didn't get back, we don't have that data. So those are the ones we actually should be looking at. But these ones survived. So a plane can get hit in these areas and be okay. So making sure that you understand what information you have and what you clearly don't, and making sure that you're thinking about what isn't available to you. This one is something that my team captain, Jen, says a lot of the time. Um, failure is weakness leaving the robot. And I say this a lot uh, in other parts of my life, but um, when something fails, you now know that failure mode and you can learn from it and better prevent it, right? Failure is not your failure. It is not a failure of your intelligence. It's an opportunity to reevaluate, to get information, and to grow and make things better. So if you have things like, if you're writing better exceptions in your code, right? You may have more failures because it's reporting more information, but it actually lets you write better code that responds more dynamically to the kinds of inputs that you need to, right? More information allows you to solve problems faster and make what you're creating a lot more resilient. And finally, I'll leave you here with um, what my captain Jen said in our most recent post-fight breakdown video. Um, you can't always control how good of a day you have, but you can control how weird everyone else's is. <laughs> and we take this to heart at hijinks, right? You, you're gonna have a, a weird, bad day sometimes, but you can make things just, you can just have fun with it and embrace the failure and have a good attitude about it. And that's what we try to bring to combat robotics, even if our failures are being seen by millions of people around the world. You can just know that you're building giant rock'em sock'em robots that are fighting on TV and remember that this is ridiculous. So I hope that when all of you are creating the wonderful things that you create, you can think about, you know, there's that fail fast, fail often, but Learn from your failures, embrace them, don't be afraid of them, and don't let that stop you from trying something new or achieving things. So, thank you very much. We got a mic here? Okay, uh, we're running a bit early. Our next talk is due at 2.05, so uh, go out, grab a drink, stay hydrated, and see you in Ideally, be back here in less than 15 minutes' time so we can start on time again. So see you soon.